All right. Um, thank you for having me again. Really good to be back at JuliaCon, and indeed locally this time, uh, not a long trek from Delft. Um, I'll be talking about what's new in, in trustworthy AI in, in Julia, um, and in particular this package ecosystem that I've termed uh, Tiger. Um, Tiger stands for, for trustworthy AI in, in, in Julia, and it's kind of a product of my, my PhD. Uh, that work has been going on for three years now, and I'm very excited to, to give an update today. So what is the, the ecosystem? At this point, we have a, a number of uh, core packages. In 2022, I presented counterfactual explanations for the first time, uh, and also Laplace Redux, which is for Bayesian deep learning. Uh, last year, I presented conformal prediction, which is a package for predictive uncertainty quantification. Uh, and this year, I also give a short presentation of, of joint energy models, which is a, a new package. Um, we've also streamlined the ecosystem a bit to move a lot of functionality that was previously in core packages into uh, various meta packages. Not all of them are super mature. Um, so tire plotting, for example, does a bit more tie piracy than I would like it to do. Uh, so if anyone is interested in, in visualization, this is a good place to, to contribute. And in terms of um, external packages from the Julia ecosystem that we, that we target, um, it's mostly MLJ uh, and, and related libraries and then also Flux, which is one of the big uh, deep learning libraries. So who's behind uh, Tiger? Um, initially, it was really just myself as a PhD, experimenting with uh, Julia for the first time in 2021. Uh, but increasingly, there's more people uh, getting involved, and I've uh, yeah, just put a few contributors here uh, to highlight uh, some of their contributions, so Moji, uh, Famamba is a, uh, he used to work at ING. ING is a, a Dutch bank and they sponsor my, my PhD. He's done a lot of contributions to conformal prediction. And then a lot of these other uh, handles that you see here point to uh, profiles of, of students at, at TU Delft who've been involved uh, in this project as well. So if you're looking for contributors, maybe for also your own work, um, these might be good people to reach out to. So. Let's get into the gist of it. Um, what are use cases for, for Taija? Uh, well, one primary use case is my own use case. Uh, I think researchers in, in AI and, and machine learning who are interested in explainability and, and uncertainty quantification could benefit from this uh, ecosystem. Also practitioners, of course, working with uh, conventional machine learning and deep learning models who are interested in understanding how do these models actually make their decisions. And then also, of course, uh, Julia developers who want to contribute uh, to a growing but still small ecosystem. So I thought I'd uh, start off this year with a bit of uh, research to just show you what can be done with these uh, libraries. And also, because that's uh, what I'm supposed to do most of my time as a PhD. Um, so to give you just a very short intro to uh, what counterfactual explanations actually are, there are one approach to explainable machine learning. Uh, there's many more. I see we have uh, Adrian Vella in the audience who has a, his own ecosystem on explainable AI using some different tools. Um, counterfactual explanations essentially work under the premise of simply perturbing the inputs into some supervised machine, lear machine learning model to see what's necessary to change the output with some target output in mind usually. So one example that is commonly given is in the, in the context of banking, personal banking, uh, you might apply to ING for a loan, and ING Bank might use some machine learning model to, uh, to estimate based on your financial data history if you're credit worthy or not. They feed this data through a black box, and then they say, well, unfortunately, you're not getting the loan. <laughs> then you have a right to an explanation, and uh, counterfactual explanations uh, offer fairly intuitive and, and a uh, useful uh, solution to this problem. And you can see that essentially in the classification context, what's happening in, in most of the time is that we're doing uh, optimization, gradient descent in the feature space. So we're perturbing uh, the inputs with some loss function in mind. I won't go into too much detail here, but we're trying to send individuals across the decision boundary from that negative outcome, application rejected, to the positive outcome, you're getting a loan. So 
one thing that you might have already seen now on, on the previous chart is that explanations in, in this context are not unique. So I can generate many counterfactuals. Is it not 30 minutes? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we can generate many counterfactuals uh, that, that get us from A to B. So here we have an example uh, for an image classifier, uh, MNIST data, a famous data set. Uh, this is a very simple neural network that was trying to, to classify digits. And we're trying to tr uh, understand what's necessary in, in the eyes of the model to go from a prediction of, of 9, which was the original correct prediction for this factual image here, to a 7. And you can see that the outcomes are very different. So these two, water and, and shoot, to me they look like adversarial examples. It's barely yeah, recognizable maybe that, that this has actually been turned, but the prediction has in fact been changed with high confidence. Uh, this, this simple neural network now predicts uh, 7 instead of 9. And then on the, the right we have a popular approach for generating plausible, realistic uh, counterfactuals. So this one actually intuitively does look uh, like a 7. And what these people use under the hood is a helper model. So they use a, a surrogate model, a uh, generative model, um, to, to understand what a 7 actually looks like, so to, to model the data generating process. And then they move in the latent space of that model, and finally it all looks good. So faced with this, we, we asked ourselves, OK, we have so many different ways to go from A to B. Which one should we use? Which is, which, which is the explanation that we should trust? Do we just show the plausible one to people and then it all looks like the model has learned uh, reasonable representations of the data? How can we do that if these other adversarial examples are also valid explanations? So our goal was to come up with a technique to generate uh, faithful counterfactuals that, that faithfully uh, represent the, the quality of the model that we're trying to explain. And to do that, we kind of forced ourselves not to use any surrogate models. So no helper tools that could allow us to learn something about the data that the model has perhaps not learned. So we rely solely on the model. Um, and we come up with, approach, with this approach called ECHO, which stands for Energy Constrained Conformal Counterfactuals, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but it essentially um, hints at the fact that we yeah, leverage ideas from conformal prediction and energy-based modeling. <coughs> and um, I think the, the key chart here is figure three. Uh, here we show the same, same starting point again, so still this, this factual image nine. And we use ECHO to generate counterfactual explanations for different models. So we have in uh, A here still the simple multi-layer perceptron. And then from A to D, we gradually improve the model. We get a bit more rigorous during training um, about uh, learning more about the data, learning plausible, uh, plausible explanations for the data. So in D, we actually have a model trained using this new package, joint energy models. And we can see that the quality of the counterfactuals gradually improves, and that reflects the underlying model, so not some, some helper tool that we've involved. So that was quite uh, desirable. And by the way, everything you see here, all these results are generated in Julia and powered by Taija. Completely different context. Um, now we're in the context of conformal prediction, predictive uncertainty quantification. Um, imagine, back to the ING example, uh, you work for ING and you're tasked with building a chatbot, a dialogue uh, system uh, that will make it easy for customers to, to log on uh, to ING's website and quickly get help with maybe their exchange rate uh, or their, their credit card got cancelled on a holiday. Um, the chatbot needs to be able to essentially identify what the intent, the intent of the classifier is, uh, sorry, of the, of the uh, client is, of the consumer. That's kind of the first task in, in uh, many of these dialogue systems. So what you can do is you use some large language model as the backbone, and then you put a classifier head on top of that, uh, and then the classifier then tries to uh, yeah, determine which intent the, 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 the customer has. But if you know a little bit about uh, classification models, they give you, in, in most cases, a, s a vector of softmax outputs, so predicted probabilities for the different uh, classes and intents. And it's very likely that if there's a, especially if there's a big space of possible intents, 
that the, the most likely, so the highest softmax output, is not actually the right answer. So just giving the top one answer and moving on is likely to go wrong. Um, so what you could do instead and what people have done is to uh, show the customer the top k outcomes. So how whatever k is, you can exogenously define that. It's not ideal, it's, it's quite ad hoc. Uh, what you could do instead is to use uh, conformal prediction to, to come up with a, a set of possible intents that fulfill certain coverage guarantees, where you can rest assured that the, the true test label is actually included in that set. And here's a, a simple application of that uh, in, in Julia. This has led to uh, another publication quite recently um, I'll just leave this here. You can um, yeah, read more about it both in this blog post and of course in the paper itself. And then yeah, we, we have more research, one upcoming at, at ICML in next week, well sorry, two weeks. Um, and then various uh, masters and, and bachelor's thesis at TU Delft now uh, working with these packages, which yeah, makes me quite happy because uh, it's yeah, to, to a large extent the uh, the product of, of my TA PhD so far. Um, yeah, and then now also more students are interested in, in contributing their own packages. So this one is very early stages, but essentially um, implementing some common techniques for, for adversarial training in Julia, all focused uh, on, on flux models. Okay, finally getting to some actual uh, software development. So in this talk, I won't go, I won't provide too much of an introduction into the different uh, packages because that's happened at previous Julia cons. If you're interested in a set of more uh, accessible introductory slides, um, feel free to scan this QR code, which uh, leads you to these slides that I presented earlier this year in, in London at the Alan Turing Institute. Yeah, I'll leave that up for a second. So instead, I'll just highlight a few recent uh, developments. So what's new in, in counterfactual explanations? As I said earlier, we've done a lot of uh, refactoring. Part of that involved moving um, functionality into these meta packages. Uh, another, um, another, thi <laughs> another thing we did was to, to use package extensions, which were presented last year at JuliaCon. Uh, that has freed up a lot of uh, loading times and just made the package a bit snappier. Um, also, a lot of performance Im improvements. I've started dabbling with uh, profiling for the first time. Um, and then we have a couple of new features and we also published in JuliaCom proceedings. So this equation we had up earlier, what you need to know here is just that the majority of approaches in this world of counterfactual explanations relies on gradient descent. And they all kind of start from this general optimization problem. And then uh, yeah, different papers, different authors have added their unique flavor to this equation to address certain desirable properties of, of explanations. And this made me think, well, if we have a library in Julia, shouldn't we make it possible for users and researchers to combine different ideas since we all typically start from the same equation. And that's led to this, um, yeah, uh, it, I would say it's still a little bit early stages, um, but we have a few nice macros here that make it easy to combine um, different penalties that people have pr uh, proposed, different uh, loss functions to essentially easily combine different ideas that the literature has come up with and come up with unique flavors of, of counterfactual generators. So if you're interested, for example, in creating a diverse set of explanations, then you could use this penalty that was proposed in this paper by Motilal et al. a few years ago. Um, if you're also interested in making sure that the explanations are very plausible, so they look realistic, uh, then you could use this uh, revise uh, method that I showed you earlier, which searches counterfactuals in a latent space of a VAE. Um, we also added more support for adding various uh, systems in the ecosystem. So besides uh, FluxJL, we have support now for models um, that are supported by the decision tree library. 
also quite recently added uh, neurotrees.jl. I think Jeremy is in the audience. Um, there's a nice talk on this coming up uh, tomorrow. Um, Laplace Redux, which is one of our own packages, and also joint energy models. Another important part, especially for researchers, is to, to benchmark the final explanations. So as you will have seen uh, or will have uh, understood by now, there's many ways to get from A to B. And different counterfactuals uh, address certain desirable uh, qualities or properties in different ways. And the literature has come up with uh, yeah, a, a large range of uh, evaluation criteria. Uh, some of these are, quite a few of these are implemented, and it's very easy to uh, evaluate counterfactuals uh, using a very simple API call. You can also run uh, large benchmarks across various uh, models and data sets, and we also have uh, support for, for uh, parallelization through both, both multi-threading and um, multi-processing. And actually, there's another talk on this. Uh, topic if you're interested coming up uh, also tomorrow. Now a uh, quick look at Laplace Redux. So Laplace Redux is a, an, an approach to Bayesian deep learning that promises to be uh, quite effortless and scalable. It relies on something called Laplace approximation, which is essentially uh, a Gaussian uh, approximation of both the prior and the, the posterior of the weights in a neural network. Uh, and it's been thought for years that this doesn't work, but then a few years ago some people realized this actually can work, and um, they pr yeah, produced a nice Python package in Torch, and essentially Laplace Redux is a, a pure Julia implementation of, of that work. Um, it was for a long time uh, fairly early stages, also when I pr uh, presented it at uh, JuliaCon in 2022, but we had a couple of students working on this uh, last year and they added a ton of new features, uh, such as um, uh, the interface to, to MLJ, which is quite important, and also support for uh, multi-class classification problems, uh, as well as some more uh, sophisticated and scalable uh, approximations of the Hessian of the neural network. Uh, again, I won't go into too much detail here, but essentially Laplace approximation needs that. So the second order derivatives of the weights of the neural network are used to uh, approximate the, the posterior, the Bayesian posterior of the neural network. And um, yeah, that doesn't scale all too well if you actually use all of the weights. So you need some more uh, sophisticated um, approximations that use less or need less information, less weights going into the final computations. Uh, and the students have, have added this and, and also added a nice blog post, which you will find on, on, on my website. Um, conformal prediction, uh, since last year, since I presented, I personally haven't done much more development work on this. I've used it in, in our research, um, but Moji Farmamba, he's added support for using conformal prediction in the context of time series prediction and also for quanta regression. So do check this out if you're interested in predictive uncertainty quantification. And then, as I mentioned a few times now, uh, joint energy models is, I think, a very interesting approach to, to modeling, to supervised learning. So these models are really hybrid models that are tasked not only with learning to predict some output, but at the same time also acquire uh, an, an understanding or, or at least uh, yeah, some, some sort of, well, learn something about the input data. And um, I used this for, again, for, for our research and implemented a, a small package in, in Julia that works with both uh, Flux and uh, also MLJ through MLJ Flux. And you can see here an example. So we have some synthetic data. Uh, the contours show the predicted probabilities, so the model clearly learns to predict the classes, the output classes. And then these little stars that you can see here, um, they're generated from the model posterior using uh, something called uh, stochastic gradient uh, Langevin dynamics. Um, and they fairly accurately um, approximate the actual data, training data that we observe. So this model has learned something about both the outputs 
and the inputs. And that turns out to have very, these models have very nice properties with respect to trustworthiness because we actually found in our work that if we generate these echo counterfactuals, so faithful counterfactuals for these models, they tend to look plausible because these, these hybrid models have learned something meaningful about the input data. Okay, a few final things. I think I have about four minutes. Uh, we have some ongoing work now through the Julia season of code. Um, one is about bridging the gap between Bayesian and frequentist approaches to predictive uncertainty quantification. Um, that's through Google Summer of Code. And then we have one uh, on adding a causal angle to counterfactual explanations and algorithmic recourse. Uh, this has been really quite fun um, and is still ongoing, so hopefully we can share some, some results in the future. And I thought it might also be nice to uh, show a student student testimonial. So in, in general, the students I've worked with at TU Delft have been quite happy and enthusiastic about working with, with Julia. Uh, and, and here, Rauno in particular said that programming in Julia has definitely uh, helped him become a better programmer. That, that also goes for me, actually. Um, and that whenever they had questions, uh, they were yeah, met by uh, friendly responses by the broader community. So I think that's a good result in itself. And finally, just one more slide. Um, if you're interested in any of this work, if you're interested in using it or contributing, uh, do feel free to reach out. Come approach me at the conference uh, or find us on, on Slack or GitHub organization. Um, I'll leave this here. The link should point you to my website where you find all of this as well. Uh, and with all of that, thank you very much for your attention and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. <coughs> so we've got plenty of time for questions. Do we have any? All right, so how does the chatbot actually work? How does the like intent classification? I came in like slightly yeah. late. Uh, let me go to the slide again. So if you already answered that, I apologize. No, no worries. Um, so are you familiar with the fast AI mm -hmm. interface? Yeah. So they, and I think metal.jl as well, they have a nice way of framing this, of calling uh, the backbone, the bigger model in, in the sort of in the background that uh, is essentially used in this context to uh, take the speech, the text that's coming in, and embed it. And then you put a classifier head on top that you can fine tune for some classification task. So, so is the does that mean the you have a language model running internally in Julia where you can do the backbone, or are you like bolting this on somewhere else? This is a fairly small model. It's like a Roberta model that yeah. I pulled from Hugging Face. Ah, so okay, it's gotcha. Not really a large language model in today's terms, I guess. Right, but it's good enough for classification. Yeah, yeah. For problem. for this, it it works fair enough. Yeah. Well okay. Enough. Cool. Thank you for walking me through that. Appreciate it. Just coming to the basic. So the event or the conf the workshop was about trustfully, yep. and you pointed out Taija. So other areas in AI are not trustfully. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Very fair question. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think this depends a lot on how optimistic you are about uh, AI in general, I guess. But there, there are a, a lot of vulnerabilities, instabilities in, in modern, especially deep learning architectures that we're very aware of. Uh, adversarial attacks is one of those. Um, but also the fact that we simply do not understand how these models make their decisions. Once they're big enough, there's just too many parameters to you know, look in there and look at. There's no linear coefficients that we can reach to easily interpret these models. So I find it very hard to trust that type of model in a, in a safety critical situations. Those are often mentioned, but also in, in more everyday life type of situations. So I mentioned the loan application. If you have no means to explain why the model um, decided that you're not credit worthy, uh, that, that's, that's problematic. And I find it hard to, to trust a model like that. 
Um, this doesn't mean that Taija, because we use that name, provides the answer to all of these questions. Uh, there's many different approaches to explainable AI, uh, but mm, yeah, my PhD is focused on on these particular topics, and and we try to uh, think critically about these AI models, and and that way uh, gain some more trust in these black boxes. No, thank you for the answer. But I'm thinking now in my company that mm. uh, even they are block chat GPT for the employees, and th we have Coplot uh, open for us. So I was thinking like, okay, then perhaps in the future we will go to Taija, uh, you know, because the vulnerability companies are thinking about that mm -hmm. already and are blocking certain areas. So what is your experience that... Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to chat to you more about it, but... Uh, I will say that it is still a fairly small ecosystem that does very specific things. Um, but yeah, we're very ambitious to, um, to develop it further and any, ki any type of uh, practical application, any, any problem that people might face, do, do feel free to approach me and we can chat more about it. Hello, I, I wonder uh, regarding explainability thing and trustworthy, like basically the main thing that you do is you perturb certain kind of parameters and then find out something. But usually you are dealing with 10, 5 parameters and their interaction can be nonlinear. So when you perturb something, my question is that knowing the, what parameters to perturb is that does not really do the explainability, right? So we always have the thinking that, oh, I know this parameter is the one that, that uh, uh, produces this kind of thing. But that does, does that really provide explainability? Yeah, so this is this is going into basically the depth of, of what all this research area is about. And, and um, as I hinted at earlier, people have come up with different uh, things that they think are desirable about explanations. So some argue that explanations should always be causal. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the Google Summer of Code uh, projects that we have is, is working on a causal implementation. Um, I find that appealing, but that approach uh, relies typically on assuming that there is some causal knowledge in the background. So that doesn't always apply. Um, they all come, I guess a short answer to your question is, in my mind, all of these counterfactuals here that you see on this, this image, they're all in some way explanatory about the behavior of the, project, uh, of the, of the model. They tell us something about the, the model. Um, and finding the right explanation that, that meets all those criteria is, is quite difficult and, and I'm not sure it's possible. Is there a danger that this kind of perturbation which is very localized in something can lead you to a um, wrong conclusion? Or so how, how confident are you that when you perturb something is you have this kind of explainability, you have the certain kind of certainty that your explanation is correct? I, I'm just, it can be just a rhetorical question, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing that's nice about counterfactuals is because they work directly with the model, we validity is, is automatically defined. The, the explanation, as soon as it switches the label in the target direction, that's, in, that's the label that's predicted by the model. So correctness is, is kind of given by construction. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that, that directly answers the question, but I'm also happy to chat more afterwards. I'm not sure about that I if that's the approach that you that you take, but like rather than cre creating a chatbot, which I I think it's a very good idea, can't we just um, give a range of coefficients to the to an algorithm and repeat the neural training of the neural network until repeating the uh, training of the neural network by giving it different randomized parameters to the neural network dancers and just um re re reassign the mod mo model uh, neuron neuron numbers in every trial if the coefficients aren't in the um intended range like can we just do that as a such yeah. option like which we will also have a clear range and clear values that rather than just saying it's not 
uh, what I want, so so that we can just say no, I wanted 0.25, but you but the model g gave me 0.2. So I think l let's take this question online because I think we uh, sorry offline because we need to move on. Um, but let's chat now. So thank you so much, but again, you. let's give him a um, round of applause <laughs> again. <for laughs>